There was a flight with EasyJet for 269 Bitcoin. So at that point today, it would be a, it would probably be an entire plane I could buy from that amount. We have this indestructible base layer and mm -hmm. every developer, every company, everybody can now compete on layer two for the best mm -hmm. scaling solutions. We will have stuff like Bitcoin banks because, you know, there will always be a part of society that just doesn't want to care about self-custody. Even the haters, even the people that talk bad about Bitcoin, they are driving Bitcoin adoption. Is it a super cycle? I've got to go out and say. Do you think is Bitcoin as a revolution, is Bitcoin as an idea actually bigger than the idea and the revolution of, of internet? Or is it just one of the parts in this digital revolution? What do you think of like the, the size and the, the, the significance of the Bitcoin revolution? I would say it's a, it's, it's a, very big part of the digital revolution, as you called it. Um, is it bigger than the internet? That's a very good question because we also have to break down the internet into different pieces. Um, I would say, so if the internet is the transmission of information and the protocol to transmit speech, at least that's how I look at it, Bitcoin definitely is the currency for it. And I would say you need the currency for it to survive. So I'm going to say it's a bit bigger than the internet, just a tiny little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, this uh, this thought experiment, because you can make an argument that uh, both is kind of interrelated, because if you have mm -hmm. the transmission of, of information uh, on the internet, Bitcoin also does the same thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. transferring information. It's like uh, how many... Uh, satoshis do you have how many satoshis do i have and we can transfer those satoshis around it's just information that we exchange and in the end of the day it's just a public ledger uh, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing more is is money yeah so it's an interesting question to, to go through but now let's let's start with with your journey like why uh, do you work now for bitcoin what drove you here uh, how did you get uh, into this uh, whole thing uh, it, it's a bit of a longer story, uh, but I'll try to keep it as simple as and short as possible. So my background actually is in the media world, media and specifically the tech world. So I uh, originally I wanted to become a banker. Um, it also kind of aligns in, within my family. My mom used to be uh, a banker. She then went into um, consulting and in finance. Um, my dad was more on the creative side of things. He was an interior designer and uh, he was more the artsy one in the family. But there was always this clear cut of like, hey, you, you kind of go into economics. So I was very much interested, but I wasn't interested in, you know, doing over leveraged derivatives trades with um, sick weirdos on Wall Street or, or also in family offices. I was more interested uh, in actually speaking to people, getting to know the world seeing the world. Um, and I should also quote that I uh, used to, since I was six, I think, I uh, used to play golf because there was a golf course right next to where we lived. And uh, I asked my mom during the summertime, like, I, I don't really want to, you know, stay with grandpa and grandma, like, can I go and play golf? And she was like, yeah, and it turned out I was quite good at it. I went, went into the Swiss national squad and, you know, all of these things and traveled the world from a very young age on through the golf sport. Um, luckily, I got a lot of like uh, scholarships and these things. So I was also very privileged to see a lot at a young age. And uh, yeah, doing that and sort of talking to the different cultures, I was like, I don't want to sit in a bank and, you know, uh, basically defraud people out of their own money. I want to, I want to go out and see the world. So I decided to study, um, media and economics. It's a very specific way of basically saying I wanted to become a journalist. And halfway through uh, those studies, I also started freelancing. And, you know, this was in, tw so I started freelancing in 2012, 2013. And roughly around the same time, there was a period where uh, the um, Occupy Wall Street protests happened in London. I wanted to go and see those. I was too young to book a flight because you still needed a parental advisor or a guide with you. And I didn't really want to ask my parents if I could book a flight. So I tried to look for solutions. How can I book? Literally, how can I buy something anonymously online? And the first link that popped up was a Guardian article about uh, Silk Road. Um, no, actually, that's not true. It was, yeah, it was about Silk Road. Uh, it was sort of the earlier days of Silk Road. There was this chat rumor going on that, uh, you know, it's, it's this weird thing. Uh, I sent it to a friend. He said, yeah, I use Bitcoin as well. 
Um, he doesn't work anymore today. He was a bit uh, cleverer than I was. And he told me, listen, if you show up with 280 Swiss francs, I can show you where to buy a uh, Bitcoin at an ATM. And I know an other guy who's actually also going to these Occupy protests. And if you want, I can ask him to join you so I don't have the issues with getting the flight. I did that. I bought the Bitcoin. I uh, installed the wallet uh, that he recommended and I immediately sent those Bitcoins out. Uh, for anyone interested, it was a flight with EasyJet for 269 Bitcoin. So at that point today, um, it would be a, it would probably be an entire plane I could buy from that amount. Um, and yeah, from that point on, I started using Bitcoin, but really as a, a tool to, you know, pay for stuff online because I didn't have a credit card. Back then, the bank cards in Switzerland uh, used to be nowhere near as digitalized as there are today. So no debit cards or these things. And uh, yeah, I wanted to, you know, buy stuff online and I wanted to use money online without basically asking for permission. And uh, did that for a couple of years. I sort of stepped in and out of Bitcoin. You know, I didn't really keep up with it. And then in 2017, I really got interested. Um, also because I was covering a lot of consumer stories. You know, I was sitting on the floor in Brussels when Mark Zuckerberg announced that he's uh, basically not spying on people when he was actually doing it. And sort of all of that influence crept into me and then also exploring Bitcoin and going down the rabbit hole in um early 2017 i think it was also leading up to like the 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 big bull run back then um and yeah sort of the first you know books and and things that came out where you were actually able to read upon bitcoin and you didn't have to spend hours on the bitcoin talk forum <laughs> uh, and you did not finish your studies no no, no, no. i was a, I, it was actually a professor of mine who went you're earning as much as someone who's getting out of university with a master's degree at this point as a freelancer um you're young enough if you want to go out and explore the world. And I was like, okay, that's enough. I have the approval from my professor. He, he may have said something differently. I can't remember it entirely. But I thought my parents like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. And, uh, you know, he said, worst case, I can come back. So <laughs> that was sort of my ticket out. But I would need to finish, uh, I think, two more semesters. And then I at least had a bachelor. And obviously, for my opinion, that's enough at that point. Do you see the, the, um, I think a lot of Bitcoiners are actually homeschoolers and they try to teach their kids themselves. They try to find alternative ways to, to get education, uh, in the younger generation. Um, do you see that the um, education system is bad? Is the education system, uh, not working? Uh, did it work for you? Uh, did you like, feel like you, you learned something that you can now use in like an actual, life did it progress you or would you would you see like there's improvements here and there so i would say it's i mean the, the education system as a whole has its uh, many issues let's call it um would i say it's failed i wouldn't say so i always had very good memories at school so i went to you know public schools up until ninth grade i think and then from that point on forward it was like a sports school where you basically did the um the uh Matura, which is the uh, abitur or the, uh, it's probably a college degree in, in Britain in, or in, uh, in uh, the US. And yeah, I, I've always had very good memories, very fun memories. I also grew up in a very multicultural uh, school district. So that was also very fun. You know, my, my schoolmates were from Thailand and Sri Lanka and uh, Albania, Serbia, uh, these kind of things. Um, some Germans as well. So that was always very pleasant. But in terms of what you learned in school, no, that was obviously, <laughs> you just wasted eight hours there and you tried to find different ways. But I was a bit, um, I was always the kid that was daydreaming and, you know, um, not really paying too much attention. I was luckily good enough to, to get the job done. Um, I could have gotten it done a bit better probably if I would have focused. But at this point, I was already interested in the internet, you know, this, this, this whole new media world that was emerging back then. So I didn't really, I didn't really spend a lot of time, um, on the school bench, as we say. I love that you actually came exactly there where you actually wanted to be. I think you said that you want to be a banker. Now you work for a company that's onboarding people, mm -hmm. uh, into their own bank. Bitcoin. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so like in a sense, you could uh, say that you are a banker, but for that company, you're making, uh, uh, news things. You're making journalist things. You're making, uh, um, a lot of things that you usually do when you're a journalist. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. like, I, would you say you, you are a journalist for relay? 
Uh, it's a good question. I mean, my, my official title is content manager and I kind of like this because uh, it sounds a bit, I mean, I always make the joke if I reach out to journalists, I, I kind of say like, you know, oh, I'm the head of content because I'm the only guy that creates content. So like I can say I'm the guy in charge. Um, yeah, but bist du jetzt weg oder was ich? Um, das weiß ich nicht, wer weg war, aber ich habe dich auf jeden Fall nur kurz nicht gesehen. Okay, okay cool. Ich, ich habe da mehr oder weniger gleich gestoppt. Das war so um, mit so einer rough cut Zeit. Um, so yeah, if I reach out to journalists, it's, I'm always making the joke that I'm head of content because um, I always say like, oh, you know, within our marketing team, we have loads of different positions filled, which is true. Like Arsene does, he was also on your show on social. Anna does our lovely graphics. Um, and I sort of do the content side, so it's not too far off, but the title is content manager and um, I'll stick to that more. But it is a lot of journalistic approaches, obviously. Um, and uh, more or less what I was doing anyway, always had my phone, always had a mic with me as a journalist, so needed to record stuff as well and, uh, you know, write stories that people read at the end of the day. Yeah, and I also love your story with like uh, you bought with your first what was it 200 300 bitcoin a plane ticket which uh, yeah. um leads me kind of to my next question uh, which what what changes do you think uh, will happen on a bitcoin standard because when we have now bitcoiners and we have this really um I think everybody knows it in the Bitcoin community with the 10,000 bitcoin for two pizzas I think it was mm. um so what do you think happens once we have adopted the Bitcoin standard? Now, of course, you spend crazy amounts of Bitcoin once you do anything. Like even now, uh, spending Bitcoin on something will uh, be uh, crazy to see in like 10, 20 years. But if you see it uh, when we are already fully adopted Bitcoin and Bitcoin is not uh, accruing too much in value, but still accruing in, in value because it's sound money. What do you think is the major change that we live through? O obviously, we have lower time preference, but what are the the, the consequences uh, you see happening? And I, I also love, like I saw for the first time ever in preparation of, of this podcast, your Substack. Uh, right, and yeah. I love your articles, uh, uh, look through uh, some of them. And I think always like people that write a lot usually have really thoughtful things in their head because they actually thought about stuff before they wrote down. So like, what do you think is like hyper Bitcoinization looking like the, the world on a Bitcoin standard looking like, um, what are the changes you, you see on a Bitcoin standard? I think I may have a little bit of a contrarian view there. I don't see a entirely different world so i know a lot of bitcoiners go like you know it's going to be generational wealth and like there will be no wars and these things and then maybe this is a little bit the journalist in me where i i just tend to question a lot of stuff more um or just always be very suspicious about what's going on and i definitely see a world where i think we will have stuff like bitcoin banks because you know there will always be a part of society that just doesn't want to care about self-custody of these things, which is a shame. I mean, I work for a company where we engage in self-custody and we urge people to do this. Um, but I think this is always a spectrum where people end up. And at the first glance, you go, oh, this is actually not good, like another banking world. But then you realize if everything is built on top of Bitcoin or if Bitcoin is the underlying um, asset, the banks at least work with a healthy asset. Let's call it this way. Uh, is it possible to rehypothecate on Bitcoin? Yes, we've seen it with like the likes of FTX and these things. But they got punished at the end of the day. You know, they don't exist anymore. And knowing this and seeing what the possibilities are, I think this gives me a bit more of a peace of mind. Um, but I do see a future where we will have more possibilities, I think, to... Either you can call it monetizing online content uh, through, um, you know, false experiments like value for value or these things, uh, which I mean, granted, there are very early and it takes a lot of also mindset shift for people to adapt. Uh, but the option is there and it's simpler for me to, you know, create a block and to monetize it and not going through the likes of Stripe or PayPal or all of these annoying financial institutions that at the end of the day are just more cumbersome work for you. Uh, and having a very simple setup. So I see more world on these kind of things. If everyone is going to lower their time preference, this is actually an interesting thought experiment. Seeing how people live day to day, I would say maybe a little bit, but not to the extreme extent as we see in the Bitcoin community right now. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Maybe also the community itself is going through a change there. 
Um, so I think there will, there will also be a little bit of that. Um, okay. I don't need to spend everything immediately or over consuming these things. Um, but of course we'll always have these, um, these hotspots and these trends and things coming up, but generally I think it's going to be a more simpler world where everyone can agree on something, whether they do, that's a different topic, you know, speaking of wars previously, but, uh, let's just be optimistic enough to say, uh, it shouldn't happen. Uh, although I think there is a possibility that it could happen. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the the view that that a lot of people and a lot of Bitcoiners have that uh, we have Bitcoin and all of a sudden all the problems are fixed. No, because in the end of the day, it's just money. Like uh, if you are lazy as fuck, you still don't get anything. Of course, if you are lazy as fuck and uh, you bought Bitcoin in 2011, you bought it with a nice self-custody solution and now you have like thousands of Bitcoin on your side. But 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 this nothing Bitcoin did there for you. You just were, mm -mm, were lucky. Just lucky. So, yeah, so like this is like exceptions to it. Um, in the end of the day, it's still just money and people that are... Mm. Um, uh, and and the, the thing that changes is you have... Everyone, if everyone has Bitcoin as their default currency, as the default uh, money, and then people have something they can rely on. Like if they work nicely, they are like can store it uh, in Bitcoin, and then they're like, oh, it, it accrues on value. If the, the focus gets shifted away from, oh, I have to be a financial portfolio manager on the side, mm -hmm. uh, I can just focus on my work what i do but you still have to do something like i also mm -hmm. see this sometimes in the bitcoin community where i'm like oh i don't have to do so much low time preference i i can like like yes you can do that if you can afford that uh, but mm. just because we have low time preference doesn't mean you have to be lazy <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I, I see this sometimes and it annoys me a little bit uh, but uh, there will be definitely i think changes coming with money we also see this in the history where uh, money influences society but i don't think it's like oh bitcoin comes and all our problems are solved where people are coming together there are conflicts there are stuffs happening uh, and yeah people will have have wars in in small families wars <laughs> but also in country wars uh, this will still happen uh, and, and and even what you said with with social media with monetization uh, it's interesting for me because um uh, even on YouTube, I have uh, uh, two channel members at the moment when this comes out, maybe more. Um, and they are giving me basically value for value without Bitcoin. Like uh, YouTube mm. does not use the Bitcoin network. So I don't know if this even is a Bitcoin thing. I think Bitcoin is more effective in streaming sites because Bit YouTube takes a big cut and mm. uh, payment providers take a big cut. But in the end of the day, uh, value for value and monetization of creators might be just changing uh, uh, on its own without Bitcoin playing its part. All, but saying with say saying with that with Bitcoin it will be more efficient because if I get from Fountain and I get from Fountain also streams and sats. I get this 100%. There's like no um, Im immediate yet. I think a small cut is with Fountain. Like a I really think they have a 5% fee, yeah. Uh, yeah. They have a, like a small fee, but it's nothing compared to, to YouTube. I got, uh, with, if you send me a super thanks for YouTube, that's a 10 uh, euro super thanks. I only get like five euros from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a big cut. That's not 5%, that's 50%. <laughs> Uh, so that I think this uh, just like a, a quick, quick uh, outlook from that. Um, coming to that topic with Lightning, and you also wrote about Lightning uh, a lot extensively on on, on your your Substack. Uh, do you see as Lightning the main layer two solution? Do you see a world where we can be on other layer twos and Lightning is not a thing? Uh, how do you see the whole scaling of Bitcoin and coming on to like this payment layers and value for value? Because value for value will never be on a on the base layer of Bitcoin. It would be too expensive to send some sats over. Uh, how do you see this whole topic with Lightning and scaling Bitcoin? So if you would have asked me three months ago, I would have gone like, oh, yeah, it's definitely going to be the uh, scaling solution because um, I, actually you you dropped the F-bomb. So now I know that I can swear as well, which which might get awesome. troublesome for you. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I was uh, lazy as fuck there to believe, okay, I, I did my due diligence on how Lightning works and like understanding the, the main um, 
value proposition and like, yeah, it will just, it will just function. Once you then actually spend more time looking at how these things work in detail and you have use cases, you kind of go like, hmm, interesting. There are a lot of these holes uh, that are just there. Whether there be in terms of, you know, not having solved certain technical difficulties or just just the way Lightning works because it's complicated as fuck and it's very hard to find good developers that actually understand it. Uh, yeah, this sort of changed my value proposition on it a bit as well in the last three months where I'm going, I think it's still the, it, it's the best idea to implement a solution like this that, you know, is on top of Bitcoin that settles instantly. But whether it be the go-to solution the way lightning is built now i very much doubt this just because um if you want to run everything in a self-sovereign way on lightning it gets very complicated quickly and um i think it's not get mentioned a lot very dangerous as well if you think about force closer and stuff of channels um and yeah you then go into this world like okay because it's a scaling solution i can maybe trust a third party a bit more so we have providers and these things and this is where you then end up with a question in my head where I go, how much decentralization do we need at every layer of Bitcoin? I want full decentralization on the main layer. But, you know, again, with the thought principle of there will be Bitcoin banks and these things, how much of that decentralization stays per, per layer? And so I look at Lightning currently as... I wouldn't say it's failed in a particular sense that you go like, oh, you know, we should forget about it. But it's been in beta for like the last six, seven years at this point. Um, we're in 2024. We can safely say it started getting momentum in 2018, 2019. So six, five years maybe. Um, and there needs to be changes. Although I've been at a meetup this week over here in Vienna. And I really much spoke to a lot of the, um, the Bolts exchange guys. I don't know if you know them. They do the liquid lightning swaps. And this was interesting again, another scaling solution. Um, more of a sidechain with Liquid, but they could use Lightning as an as an integration tool and less than actually a main like layer where you build everything in. So this sort of sent me down a rabbit hole where I went, okay, um, I think the use case for Lightning is there. The simplicity is well, if I say simplicity, like it settles instantly and it's quick. Like this is this is the simplicity I'm speaking about. Um, but I think it will shift to being more of a transport protocol, similar to the internet, to TCP IP. And uh, it will probably use a lot of its advantages to, in the future, potentially connect more scaling solutions. And um, it will, I think, not be like the go-to thing where we get 8 billion people on at the current rate. There are a lot more smarter people out there than me. Uh, that most definitely, I mean, I, I produce content for a living. I, I don't code or anything. So like, you know, there you go. Um, and I'm sure that they will find solutions, but I, I see it more at a um, sort of like a, how could you say, pivotal point currently where it's either going to stay the way it is or it will adapt. And I'm leaning more to the adapt side of things uh, because Lightning is so open and you can use it for many different things. You can, you know, pretty much program it the way you want it to. Um, I think we'll have uh, different use cases there. Yeah, I think the Lightning has, uh, like, the important thing to note here, we have this indestructible base layer. And mm -hmm. every developer, every company, every uh, everybody can now compete on layer two for the best mm -hmm. scaling solutions. And this is the amazing thing, because if Lightning fails, it does not matter. Like th there will be mm -hmm. something else uh, on top of Bitcoin that will succeed at some point because we have this amazing uh, uh, indestructible base layer where everybody can just build on top of that. And I heard so much about Fediment, about Liquid, about Lightning. Yep. And yep. I have kind of this view. I don't know too much about the layer solution. So I always try to ask people to, to get more information on that side. Uh, and I don't care too much about it. <laughs> because yeah. in the end of the day, we have some money, we have Bitcoin. And uh, if it's true that it will also be some money as medium of exchange and unit of account, there will be uh, uh, models on top of that, techniques on top of that, layers on top of that, because there is the incentive to do that. And just because there's the incentive to do that, um, 
this is enough for for me to say like we have this layer and they will be uh, built on top of that and maybe uh, as an interesting experiment as in conversation uh, going forward uh, you also have been to El Salvador you also wrote about that uh, and you probably used lightning there uh, do you see, how do you see the adoption there growing when when did you go to El Salvador was this like a few years ago or was it recently so um it was in november for the adopting early november and um how shall i explain this i would so it's a bit of a mixed feeling you have there um from what i've heard uh, when i spoke to people on the ground luckily i'm i'm, I'm fluent in spanish so i was able to you know speak mm. their language as well and get the the uh, the proper feedback let's call it because uh, i think there's always a language barrier if they maybe need to speak english or something and um You see an adoption in certain places like Bitcoin Beach, you have Berlin and these kind of things. But I also paid, I think I wrote about this in my blog post, uh, on the top, almost at the top of a volcano to a BTC Pay server. And I asked the guy, like, why do you use BTC Pay? And he goes, you know, oh, I started out with um, the Chiba wallet, so the, the state sponsored wallet, and it was shit. And I started looking around and I just went down this rabbit hole. Um, but generally speaking, you had a lot of people, you know, using still custodial services. But then again, after spending two weeks there, I realized that's okay because they don't have the luxury of doing proper self-custody. And uh, I mean, imagine that you, you're living, most of these people live in self-built houses if they're part of the lower class. Uh, if you're part of the middle class, you maybe live in like a normal house as we know it over here in Europe, but it's very much tiny. It has cold water. Uh, you know, you're not, you don't have the standards we have here. And um, yeah, Do you have the luxury to like run your own node to set up everything and to basically uh, use Bitcoin in a fully self sovereign way? Very much unlikely. They do have Amazon. So I asked this, like, can you actually order the parts and stuff? And they went like, oh yeah, that's not a problem. Um, but obviously this is only possible to people who also have access to bank accounts. Um, so there are two things that happen. Either way, if they find Bitcoin, they're going to use a custodial because they maybe have 25, 30 bucks monthly in Bitcoin in that custodial wallet. And this is like everything to them. So it's simple for them to set up and get going. And you have great companies on the ground like Galloy that actually also do a lot of education or they use cash. So I pretty much paid with cash or I paid um, with Lightning. And uh, actually one on-chain transaction, but it was my fault in the hotel because uh, uh, he didn't set the wallet to Lightning at default. So I spent a very, uh, very high fee on, on my three nights in El Sante, but that was okay. He did a phenomenal job anyway. And um, yeah, so this is the default state. If you've been there though, you do realize these people are not used to tourism. They give 125% to make you happy, you know, to help you out. Um, At one point, I even uh, had an Uber that didn't find my place. And the guy just basically drove me to the main city. That's an hour's drive for him. He just did it because he's like, oh, let me help you out. Um, so they're very, very open, very nice people. Um, they now don't live through these horror times they used to live before. So the country is evolving, but it's, it's definitely nowhere near, you know, to a Bitcoin standard as we would think about it. But having spoken to the people, and again, I've spoke to them in their native language, so it, it wasn't filtered or anything. Um, they told me that, you know, um, they have adoption, they, they see the value. And uh, also to those who had custodial services, when I explained to them that you can do self-custody, they were aware of it um, and they're just on their journey to it. I think this is what we sometimes need to do better in the Bitcoin community, have a little bit of patience. Um have a little bit more time to give people these, these, uh, these, you know, ups and downs we have all been through, you know, either losing money or like sending it to a wrong address or, you know, having to figure out how self custody works. Um, so I think they'll get there. Um, but it's great to see if you speak to these people, you know, they really, they really like and they're proud of their country and that you come to El Salvador because of Bitcoin. That's also where they're super happy. So that was very much uh, cool to see. And, um, yeah, getting to use lightning almost at the top of a volcano was also uh, was also an experience uh, it's amazing i think uh, el salvador can be such a good role model and i think this is also why so many bitcoiners and, and bitcoin maxes are coming there and trying to figure out uh, how el salvador can be better i think you know, like uh, max kaiser and stacy herbert they are uh, getting uh, the lift there right now lina seiche uh, kind of moved there she's not not 
100% settled, but I think she, she kind of settles down there. And there are so many more uh, that are going there. Yeah. To be fair, I mean, Max and Stacy can probably live wherever they want. Um, yeah. Because um, I, I am very much, I'm, I'm not skeptical of them as, you know, um, like, oh, there are like um, uh, spooks or anything, or you hear these crazy theories sometimes on Bitcoin X. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, it's easier if you move into Bitcoin at a certain uh, pace or if you have the opportunities because, you know, you you had different advantages. I mean, Max used to work on Wall Street. He then created his um, weird trademark thing with like the actor stocks and things and he got on board very early with gold and he did he did realize what bitcoin is at the dollar so props to him um but i think they if if uh, if, if there's a better el salvador popping up i'm sure they could also move there pretty quickly but it's good to see that they under that they understand that you need to be on the ground and you need to support for my taste there's a bit of too much political simping um just again I don't trust politicians and, and I don't really um I don't really want to know what goes on behind you know closed doors in these uh, offices or in these talks um, everywhere around the world, whether that be El Salvador, the States or over here in Austria. As you know, we have our fair share of scandals here as well. Um but yeah, it, it's cool to see that they're there and uh, that they're also able to, you know, sort of hold the flag up for Bitcoin because um it is hard if 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 you speak to people outside of our ecosystem and explain that El Salvador is going through a once in a lifetime change probably. And I kind of go like, yeah, I don't care. It's this country in Central America. Like, okay, they got a bit more tourism. Why should I? And if you have people like Max who are very much loud and, you know, they can attract a lot of attention as well, uh, that at the end of the day is a net benefit for Bitcoin. Like most of the stuff the community does. Yeah, I think everything uh, kind of is a benefit for Bitcoin in the end of the day, because even haters I had uh, in uh, JKU in my university that I was for one whole semester <laughs> did not do any uh, any exams there also. So I was not really in university, but I heard some some lectures and there was one lecture uh, and I don't want to call anyone out. It was just a random lecture lecture and the lecture was not about Bitcoin. It was not about anything related to Bitcoin, but he always spent the first lecture talking about Bitcoin and talking bad about Bitcoin. Uh, oh, yeah, and, this, and this is interesting uh, because he did not have any um, reason to do that. And I always take this example as a hater who uh, drives Bitcoin adoption to the better because there will be uh, students in that room that will be like, why is he talking about Bitcoin now? Let's let's uh, search about Bitcoin on YouTube. And then all of a the sudden they are on a podcast and all of a the sudden they are falling down the rabbit hole <laughs> because someone said something bad about Bitcoin. So even the haters, even the people that talk bad about Bitcoin, they are driving Bitcoin adoption. And so yep. uh, no matter if it's uh, a Bitcoin maxi like Max Kaiser, uh, or it's like a Bitcoin hater or everything in between there, they're all driving Bitcoin adoption because uh, they're talking about it. The, the worst thing that can happen to Bitcoin that nobody cares about it. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen, but I don't think it will happen. Huh? Yeah, having worked a long time in the media and, you know, also still still engaging with it, you know, there's nothing as, as simple as bad or good PR. Everything is PR at this point, you know, so you accept the, you just accept the fate and um I don't know. This is something, this is something with me personally. And I have friends who also tell me this, uh, you know, I could get into the angriest discussion with waiters or, or, um, as I like to call them, um, communists in bars over here in Vienna. If they see a sticker on my laptop that shows, uh, you know, Bitcoin. And then they explain to me that it's an energy waste. And then, you know, I'm just, I'm basically a, a dickhead on purpose. And I go, but isn't using too much energy a good thing like shouldn't we use more energy and you know then there's the counter argument and i go into a question again and sort of i just start poking at people because i find it fun at this point and i do, I do troll. troll um but yeah at the end of the day it always ends up that they basically go okay i don't know the answer to this question and i kind of go well how can you make an informed opinion about something you don't understand so uh, i think if you always go to this journey whether they are going to convert to believe in bitcoin or not it's like you say, it, it attracts people and it uh, either shows them the value prop of BitQ, Bitcoin, um, or just how stupid people are. And I think both both things are, are a positive thing. I, I think I have to go to uh, with you to a restaurant at some point in Vienna when I move there. 
<laughs> that will be fun. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we could go, we could go into the uh, sixth, seventh, or eighth district. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of woke, <laughs> and you know, they they're very much against Bitcoin. There, I believe we are trying to orange pill, and it's always fun. But you know, um, yeah, I, I'm sure if we if we cross a certain price point, as we've always had in the bull runs, um. Also, these people will be at one point interested because at this point it then gets too good to be ignored. And you may have to, you know, leave your very much high point of view and ethics of yourself behind to maybe invest a little bit. Uh, cause most of them do. They just don't admit 21 Bitcoin is. Bitcoin only from day one and they teach and preach self-custody. This is my go-to exchange when someone asks me, oh, where can I buy my Bitcoin from? This is the easiest entry for Bitcoiners. And if you want lower fees, plus at the same time support this podcast, use code Robin and click the link in the description. And it's also an interesting thing that's happening right now. The prices are all time high or right around the all time high, depending on uh, what the price is when the interview is coming out and what it is right now. Uh, I mean, it could have even be like at 100k because I'm, uh, the podcast is coming out in two, three weeks. Let's see, uh, what happens. Um, but I think the buzz around Bitcoin is still low. I think, uh, yep. there is yep. in, in the outside of the Bitcoin world, nobody is talking about Bitcoin. Uh, the people are not interested in it. Uh, and this makes me really bullish because the price is still so high. I, Obviously, it's because of the Bitcoin ETFs, of the massive inflows. Uh, do you see a major bull market coming? Do you see a major, maybe even super cycle coming this this one? Because we have the companies with Michael Saylor and then more uh, companies. We have the Fastby rule. We have the ETFs. We have so much things going on and the halving is uh, like one month away when this comes out the having is really mm -hmm. close by uh so uh what, what do you see like uh happening in the next few years months so uh is it a super cycle i'm gonna go out and say no because every time we have a new all-time high this is the first thing people speak of like oh the super cycle or you know we're going to i don't know insert crazy number here um so i don't think it is because what would be a super cycle? You could look at Bitcoin from its inception. Isn't it kind of already in a super cycle? Like eating, we spoke about the internet previously, but my first question, uh, it's growing massively faster than the internet has ever done to this point. So you could argue this is super cycle in itself, but I don't think we're going to it in terms of price. Um, okay, let's, let's leave out if we go into like, if we're going to nuke ourselves to death in the next coming years, um, because apparently our leaders just like to basically do this. Um, if you look at it from a purely economical standpoint, we have a high interest rate environment. By the way, to all the fudsters who for some reason see this clip now, uh, Bitcoin did better in the high interest rate environment since it's, since the Fed and all of the ECB and stuff started to hike. Uh, that it actually did in the low interest rate. Um, obviously, in the low interest rate, it worked because of the money printing. Now it's sort of decoupled and proved, hey, it, we don't give a shit. Honey Badger don't care really at this point if you increase the rates or if you decrease the rates. Um, but just from that standpoint on, they have to decrease. They have to print more money. At one point, we, we hear him say it all over the, the news now. Um, I mean, even fucking Christine Lagarde should be in jail by this point for whatever co fraud she's committing with the euro and for whatever fraud she's been committed as she has committed in the past that she's also been convicted of as an IMF leader and in French politics. Um, they all said we have to at one point ease, bring some ease and less pain into the system. So if more liquid money is available again, and not just on the layer of central banks and commercial banks, but it gets into, let's call it the retail realm, surely if we look at the past, there must be some form of uh, price increase again. Whether that is up to like these crazy numbers you hear, I think two days ago I heard someone say um, it's going to 600K in like a couple of months or something um, because this and that happened, you know, in last runs and stuff. Uh, I don't know. I, I have no idea where it's going. I just know, I think by the time this podcast comes out, if again, no third world war starts. I think we're going to be higher in terms of fiat uh, denominated than what we are now. Um, and yeah, if, if, if everything continues the way they said that it's going to do, less rates and uh, more money printing, we should see uh, a higher 
all-time highs or, or just crazy numbers in the next coming months. Um, but yeah, you know, we're, we're all euphoric now because the price is up and we're all, we're all super hyped. We'll, we'll, we'll see if that sticks up. Um, I don't see a future where you should open a short position now, like some influencers do. Um, but yeah, just looking at these basics, you should say it should, it should hold up and, uh, you know, we can, we can go for a few roller coaster rides upwards. Definitely. And uh, it's so, so fascinating for me because everybody has a different theory about the price. I, uh, I just published the episode with Giovanni from the Bitcoin Power Law, who tries to uh, model the, the Bitcoin price uh, with the Power Law. That's also happens in the nature and stuff like that. Really interesting episode. I went over two hours with him, I think two hours and 10 minutes. Wow. Uh, in the first three hours, it seems that people are really crazy about that episode and really like it, uh, just from the st statistics. And he has this like in 10 years and 2033, we are at a million, which seems actually really reasonable. The, this would mm -hmm. bring us in this cycle to 250,000, something like that. Seems like a reasonable uh, approach. Then there are people like Peter Tanworth. I just interviewed like two days ago. No, the last interview, like actually the last interview before this episode, the, the episode is with Peter Tanworth. So he, he is famous for saying that B, uh, Bitcoin will uh, go to 7 billion US dollars per coin, which is just an unbelievable number. <laughs> but it's also interesting how he thinks of it and the interesting part is when you hear those people talk, how they come to the price, it's always um, kind of logical. But then you step out of, of those things and you compare and you're like, this does not make sense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I always I'm, wonder... I always wondered this point, like how much of it is also social media cloud, you know, because uh, we know yeah. what we need to say. I mean, if we both now open our mouths, we add laser eyes and funny graphics to a thumbnail, you know, it will instantly do better than um, if we just do a normal thumbnail. Like these kind of rules apply um, also in the Bitcoin community. So I kind of wonder how much of it is cloud. But um, yeah, you're right. There is always a model or a way for them to justify the price. Uh, I can't remember who said it, um, but all of your models are broken. It's, it's uh, one of the more famous American Bitcoiners who's quoting this at conferences as well. So if I go by this, which I've seen enough now in a lot of bull runs, maybe he's right. Maybe they're right. You know, I don't know at this point, but I just know that over time, because Bitcoin is disinflationary currently and it will be deflationary once the last Bitcoin is mined, um, my value that I hold in it now should be worth more in the future. And that for me is enough to know um, that, yeah, we're on the right track. And that's why we just DCA in, right? Because once we try to trade the market and time the market, we getting in a territory where we just cannot do it. Like we, we don't know what is happening. And uh, we only know that Bitcoin is some money and will increase in value over time. This is something mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain about obviously things can happen obviously nothing is 100 percent. but uh, i'm young enough and i'm uh, risk averse enough that i'm like i'm willing to bet on this that bitcoin mm -hmm. will grow to these levels and i think we will hit the 100k i think we will hit the 1 million i think we will hit also the 10 million mark i just don't know why and i, I just don't know how i uh, know <laughs> when? <laughs> when, uh, when i wanted to say <laughs> as this would be a good clip <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I know we're going there i just don't know why and how <laughs> yeah 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 uh, but uh, true but, you know it, it applies with all the w's like why should we go there i don't know how should we go there i don't know when i definitely don't know so like why should we care but yeah it, probably you and i were roughly around the same age um i think uh, we, we don't need to worry about it too much um uh, i could see if i like had kids now and thank god i don't because I literally live off Mate, Red Bulls, and, and a few sushi things in my fridge. So I'm, I'm not a good role model in that sense. But if you do have these responsibilities, I think you would look at it a bit differently. But then again, same rules apply, right? The value should increase over time, and that should be good enough for you to know that you're on the right track. Maybe you don't YOLO into it like we do, but, you know, life, life is there to enjoy it, right? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I have an interesting question for you. Do you self-call, mm -hmm. would you, would you self-call yourself? Would you call yourself a Bitcoin maximalist? Uh, no, I would. I, I used to. I used to call myself one. I also used to be very toxic, um, just because everyone used to be, and you tried to be part of the cool gang. Um, 
I would call myself more an optimist, a Bitcoin optimist. This is what I always like to say, an enthusiast, if you want to say so. Um, but I do acknowledge the fact, and I know a lot of toxic maxis don't do this. There is other shit out there, namely stuff that will promote the CBDC infrastructure and the Fed coins and these kind of things. And they have certain value propositions that are more interesting to, you know, let's call it the banking world or the insurance world or just different businesses. So I'm okay with that. I don't mind. I think uh, all of these altcoins are a test that for Bitcoin anyway. And uh, we do see this with the most crazy shit like ordinals. I don't have an interest in NFTs. I don't get art on the blockchain. But Bitcoin NFTs essentially ate up the ET uh, the um, NFT markets on ETH and Solana and all of these weird other tokens. And they found a way into Bitcoin. If this leads to hyper-Bitcoinization and these experiments are there, um, that's okay, I think. So um, who am I to judge how people want to spend their money for these things? But I would definitely not call myself a maximalist just because... What is a maximalist? You would, own, you would probably only need to live on Bitcoin. And this means paying your rent, your goods in Bitcoin, at least from my understanding. Um, I always like if maxis call out people for having other assets like stocks or bonds and these kind of things. But, um, you know, they then invest into like stuff like Tether or USDC because you don't need a stable coin to buy your sats on an exchange. Um, they obviously have Bitcoin and they probably also have fiat because you still need to pay in fiat for some stuff in your daily life unless you're willing to go routes. Um, so just from that standpoint, on maximalist didn't fit anymore. Um, and optimist or enthusiast is more... I'm saying optimist in the community and enthusiast with like my friends because um, they know that I can be a dickhead if, um, if I start the argument. So <laughs> this is sort of the neutral way for me to go about it. That's interesting because uh, Michael Saylor uh, made in Madeira the... the... Uh, presentation that he went from being an investor and he went for all the step and his mm -hmm. last step was like i'm a bitcoin maximalist but at the same time he says that he does not see necessarily bitcoin becoming a medium of exchange he uses the fiat mm -hmm. dollar uh, but then also he says on, on national tv that uh, people that save in uh, fiat are uh, poor people Stupid. i think he said yeah yeah uh, Something like that. Uh, so uh, I think Bitcoin maximalist, like it's 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 a term a lot of people uh, scream about, but everybody seems to have a little bit of a different definition. In the end of the day, I'm just caring about is this person a Bitcoiner or not? Mm. And Bitcoiner has nothing to do with how many Bitcoin you have. It has yep. to do with the mindset. Uh, do you do, are you a self sovereign mindset? Are you a mind, uh, mindset that has uh, certain values? And I even see. People that have gold and 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 stocks yep. and real estate also in their portfolio as Bitcoiner. There are even Bitcoiners with no Bitcoin because they don't, they didn't understand Bitcoin till now. But they yep. are in the Bitcoiner yep. mindset and they will just need time to get to that uh, mindset. There are a lot of people out there uh, in that. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, so, I also you know I, I I'm also. Um, um, Okay, I only have, I still have my stock portfolio because I was too lazy to figure out how to transfer it from uh, one country to another. You know, with um, you have sort of different models in all of these brokerage accounts. Luckily, my brokerage allows me to basically transfer within them. Um, but yeah, I still have some tech stocks. I still have some of these things, you know, from back in the day. Um, they're doing shit at this point. And ironically, all of them hold large cash reserves uh, and not a Bitcoin treasury. And yeah, I also own micro strategy stocks because I do want to support their Bitcoin strategy and the vision that they share. And it's sort of been the unofficial ETF anyway. I also own some shares into the ETFs just because I thought, you know, uh, sort of trying to help Wall Street out because, uh, you know, it was it was a fun thing to do. Um, and I, I'm into the uh, Vanek uh, ETFs because it had the HODL ticker. And I thought like, yeah, that's cool. Um, and some shares into iBit. But um, this has like no connection to me the way it does if, if I look at my proper Bitcoin stack. So am I a maxi now or not? I don't really care at that point, but I think uh, I keep the torch up high to to get as many people into Bitcoin. And that's my goal behind it, right? Not to, I don't know, not to be the 10,000 laser eyes guy on, on social media. Sorry for anyone listening. I hope you're, I hope you're offended because that's the idea behind uh, having an open discussion, right? <laughs> that's uh, that's really cool um and this brings me a little bit to the next topic and uh, we talked about marketing we just talked about uh, investing and for investing in marketing and 
for all it's working and we need startups, we need uh, companies that mm -hmm. do stuff just as Relay. And Relay, Relay has VC money behind it. And I mm -hmm. think uh, it's, it's always interesting because we need more, I think we need more VC money in uh, Bitcoin. Same. I mean, in Europe in general, like I think uh, we, we, when we see the capital uh, flowing in America and then we see the capital flowing in Europe, it's just uh, really poor. <laughs> it's like we, yep. America has yep. way more capital. That's why the Bitcoin ETF is also a bigger thing when it's uh, happened in America than when it happened in Canada or Europe. Uh, so do, do you see um, also this thing where we don't have enough VC capital? And do you see a way for Europe, for Bitcoin to accrue more VC capital, just as I think Rila is quite successful actually as a Bitcoin company to get VC capital? <laughs> So I think my answer is going to be in three parts. First of all, um, this is a shout out to, I think Manu runs the account from Münzweg podcast. Uh, he, for some reason, uh, you know, called us out a few days ago and I had to hold myself back at this point because, you know, uh, we did, we, we did the marketing team at Relay, like we're pretty much fluent. Arsen is the social guy, but if it's a German answer, I sort of have to answer. And then we were, uh, he attacked us there uh, for having the audacity to accept VC money. Uh, because somehow the VCs have an influence into company in company decisions, which is true at a certain point. But, you know, um, if you run a company under the guidance of venture capitalists who are also uh, basically at the whim of their liquidity partners and like the people that actually provide the money for them to invest, you do realize that we all align on the same goal. And with uh, Relay specifically now to quote us, but also with other Bitcoin companies, they have Bitcoin only VCs or specific tech VCs that understand the value prop of Bitcoin again, saying value prop a lot of this podcast, I apologize uh, looking back at it now. But um, yeah, to call these things out, I just go, this is silly because it's like you mentioned, we have to go against America from a European standpoint. We have to go against tech. I mean, AI, for example, in my opinion, does a lot of good, but there's also a lot of crap that just, you know, wraps a chat GPT wrapper and builds a shitty product and raises like a hundred million dollars or companies that are like 14 days old and they get a $4.5 billion evaluation. Like imagine these kind of things. We're way off from these numbers in Bitcoin. Maybe also a bit because we kind of have this dickish attitude uh, towards uh, venture capital. Um, so to have that thought experiment, to go back to um, my um, sh shouting out there on the, the account I mentioned, it doesn't help. It doesn't help ecosystem. We need a short-term solution to basically grow as fast as we can, even faster than what the Bitcoin network does already. Um, so that's where you need this help. That's why you get venture capital money in. And second part to your answer, yes, Relay has been raising well, but again, compared to other tech companies, um, I bet they're laughing, they're laughing at the amounts we raise because for us, it's a lot of money, right? We can do a lot with it in the Bitcoin community. But again, for tech companies, and if you put it into perspective, it's not a lot. Um, so we need more of that. We also need to be more proactive. And the third part you mentioned, Europe versus USA, definitely. I mean, we have a lot of great venture capitalist um, family offices. We have a lot of great uh, minds that, you know, had multiple exits and founded their own funds. The issue is just our attitude towards investing as a whole. I mean, we are from the German speaking area of Europe. And what is it that you learn at a young age? You save, you don't invest. And if you're smart enough in the past, before Bitcoin, you were able to invest into hard assets like gold. Um, again, all of the maxis. It's a bit more than a pet shiny rock, in my opinion, because gold had its use cases and it still does if you look at how it's being used. Um, but that's it. Like you didn't really, you didn't go out on a limp and you risk stuff. And Americans are just way more used to this, maybe also with their whole history and the way things came about. And out of that, they already have a competitive advantage because they're hungrier to get shit done, to innovate new stuff and to go out there. And we just lack a bit in that attitude. There are certain countries in Europe that do it better than others, obviously. But we definitely need more of that money. I also think we need more failure in Europe. Um, I always see people um, you know, being scared that they get laid off or that the company fails. And uh, failure is a good thing. You learn not what not to do, right? And ideally, 
if like, people don't kill themselves or if nothing major happens, you'll eventually don't do the mistake again. Or if you do it again, it's not going to be as big as you did it previously. So you're constantly in that forward motion instead of staying uh, passive. Um, so yeah, to recap, shut, shut the fuck up if you're on social and you criticize people who take on the risk to building these products. We need this help. It needs to grow faster and uh, capital from the outside is the fastest way of growing. Um, whether that be a VC fund, a Bitcoin whale, or, you know, just a crowdfund you do, you need this to get there. Secondly, uh, we need to get off our ass in Europe because we need to, we need to catch up with the rest of the world. And uh, thirdly, if we do, it's okay to fail. We just need to keep moving forward. And I think if we combine all of that, you will then in the future see the big investment rounds into Bitcoin companies. Um, and uh, yeah, I can see a future where one of the Bitcoin only companies specifically, you know, will be able to raise like a quarter of a billion, maybe half a billion, because people will finally understand, oh, we shouldn't waste our time with like AI or um I don't know what's latest again. People are probably into Web3 again because, you know, uh, the, the tokens they still hold in their wallet somehow are worth something now again. So they invest money into it again. Instead of focusing or wasting time there, uh, they get into Bitcoin. They potentially will write bigger checks. And this is a good thing. Like we need this money to get there because eventually if everything leads to Bitcoin, right, it doesn't matter if they give us fiat now or later, it will turn into Bitcoin anyway. So uh, why not use the opportunity and accept it to get there faster? Yeah, and I don't know what the thing is bad about venture capital. It's just people putting money in the company. And of course, if influence, like, uh, why should you not have? Uh, and uh, the same way as Julian, as the CEO, has influence over over Rile, the same way as everyone involved in the, even you uh, as a, as an, normal employee has influence over relay everyone involved in the ecosystem has of course influence over relay. i can start a 51 percent attack with my shares no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> like uh, that's i think i think that's nothing bad i, I don't know what no. uh, i did not watch the episode i don't uh, didn't uh, watch his uh, his argument but uh i I'm, I'm i'm screaming about it that we need more capital in in, in bitcoin and venture capitalists have a lot of capital uh, and if they deploy it to bitcoin instead of some shitcoin project i'm happy mm. and if i mean they look want at to look at what happened with the etfs the amount of capital that flows into it and we all know it's not real bitcoin but guess what it helps if the fucking boomers can allocate 100k from their trading account that just sits there in fiat anyway via phone because they're lazy as fuck to not log into a web interface and they tell their broker hey just buy some of these shares and like i'm okay if it performs well this is a big step we didn't have this before and i've heard about bitcoin etf since 20. 13, 14? When was the Wiggle was one? I remember getting picked up in 2014. I remember Pete Rizzo actually writing about it very early on and reading about it and it's failing and, you know, all of these things. So we finally got there. And if we can do the same thing with investor money, um, this is going to be a net positive because we see what people do with little to nobody in the Bitcoin community. Imagine what's possible if they can actually spend money to get it out to more people. Definitely. And we need more capital uh, investment in Bitcoin. We need more people talking about Bitcoin. We need more podcasts. We need more everything. Like uh, I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to be welcome about stuff. Like if we try yep. to like, oh, they should not be involved in, in Bitcoin because this and that, like, <laughs> what the fuck? We are trying to revolutionize money. Uh, we are yep. trying to welcome everybody in. And you are saying he cannot be involved because what he did. It, it kind of leads me actually into something. Um, I'm really fed up about the Bitcoin community. And I think, uh, not to put me at the same level as Sailor, um, I'm definitely not there. Um, I mean, but close. frankly, yeah. no, I mean, frankly, there may be stuff I understand better than he does, mainly mm. how to talk to people. Cause, um, <laughs> he's actually, if you, if you think about the conference, he's really funny. If like a lot of people get to him, you just know the guy either has autism or he just doesn't like a lot of people, uh, because he's, he's like, his nervous system breaks down. He doesn't know what to do at this point. He just takes his selfies. He moves on. Um, he's sort of the grumpy dude. Um, but I, I bet he just wants to have his peace and stuff. Uh, that's on a funny side note. But what I'm really fed up with about the ecosystem is, we're sometimes very blind to our own beliefs. And what I mean by this is, oh, you know, stuff like we've already won. Well, what does winning look like? Like, I don't think so personally. Are 
is everyone on earth using Bitcoin? No. So in that terms, I think we don't have, we haven't won. Um, or also things like, oh yeah, it's for everyone. But then you have people who may have legit criticism, and I'm not talking about energy or things, but you know, thought experiments like, uh, um, should we, should we stick to the 21 million? I personally think so we should. Uh, or do we have a flexible system that, uh, has a consensus change and it's written into code that we can all still vote on these things. And people like this get ripped apart. I'm not saying that this is a good thing. I don't believe it would be, but we at least should have the open discussion about it. And sometimes this can be very much guided, you know, by these online voices because it is cool to be pro or against something. Having said that though, if you've never been to meetups and you meet, Bitcoiners in real life go do this because the more people you meet in real life, the more you realize, oh, um, people actually think a lot more alike and they are more open to this, talking about these thoughts than what appears on social media. Because guess what? Every one of us is a dickhead on social because it is cool. And it is that dopamine that hits you early in the morning or late at night if you need it. Um, but yeah, if there is one thing I would criticize, it's exactly that. We, we we need to be a bit more, I think, critical and a bit more open-minded, really open-minded to also, hey, except if there is criticism and people are not going to change their mind or something, that's fine. But at least we're having the discussion. 100%. I, like, I couldn't even agree more. It's like uh, really, really cool what you're saying. And I think this is um and refreshing bitcoin conversation today and uh, i like where we are going with it um but we are actually uh, unfortunately coming closer to the end before we coming to the end routine which is an mm -hmm. amazing interesting question and it, it really ties back to what we just said and i'm really curious what you're saying then uh, before i want to ask you something completely unrelated to bitcoin you write a lot i saw your sub stack you write uh, for for a relay you write for yourself uh you you do a lot with with writing things down writing your thoughts down and i think this helps you form your um thoughts from your arguments well in your head and i unfortunately don't do it like i don't do any writing i do a lot of speaking i have uh, i'm coming to a routine where i have two podcasts a day one for myself and one where i'm a guest appearing so it's like i'm i'm really speaking a lot and i know that i'm getting better in speaking actually with that uh, experience but i sh but for people that uh, did not do any uh, writing uh, for themselves like I'm not talking about writing with their friends. I'm not talking about shit posting on Twitter. Uh, I'm actually thinking, uh, saying about like sitting down and writing a comprehensive article about a, a topic and really thinking the, this thing through, like this is a different kind of writing. Uh, I think you know what I mean. Do you recommend to people to start doing this? What, what changes or what benefits do, did you get from, from doing that? And would you even encourage me to, to, uh, start writing something? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just trying to look for my backpack because I can show this with a more visual uh, quote, which really helped me because there's two things to my writing. So I'm not a slow typer or anything. I, I can, I would say I could type pretty fast, but I'm horrible at gra grammar. Like, thank God shit like Grammarly and Mentor do that these things exist um, because, uh, you know, I don't know. All of my journalist friends, we somehow are bad at grammar. There's always like one of these, um, I call them like the comma Nazi because, you know, uh, they always know what like the rules are and what they need to do. And I have a very good friend of mine. She, uh, she always actually comes up to me and goes like, ah, you should form the sentence differently. Um, but what really helps me is I think if you write, um, all you do is you're just expressing your thoughts and our heads are messy. Everyone has a different thought pattern. Um, I mean, there's countless studies of how different ways um, our brains work with like the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere and these things. But what really helped me is basically, you know, like you did in school, um, I can maybe put something, I'm just having these notes and having these doodles and having these things in your everyday life. This is a notebook I started two weeks ago and it's already almost full, like one of these little fill up ones. And just expressing what you're feeling, um, taking notes wherever you can. This doesn't mean I document my entire life, but sometimes I have an idea and I pick out this notebook and I write it down, I doodle it down, whatever. Um, and getting used to really expressing your thoughts. I like to draw and write by hand. Other people, you know, record their voice. Um, they, they take photos and screenshots of stuff, whatever it is, trying to have an expression. And then having that data there to either process it into an article, a video, or just something 
um, you want to express. I think this helps immensely. Whether this makes you a better writer, I don't know. If I look at the time spent as a journalist with my editors and fighting for the way I want to say a sentence or not, um, knowing I'm, I'm fully in the wrong, probably because the grammar doesn't hold up, but I want to express it my way and I want to add my character. Um, I think this is the right way to go. People engage if something is authentic and this doesn't have to be perfect because nothing is in life. Um, and I think the more you express yourself in these kind of different ways and you put something out there, the more you also find your inner voice and the more you're able to then publish these articles, videos, whatever it might be. Um, and yeah, who knows? Maybe you're able to pick up writing on a daily basis. I write a lot on a daily basis. I don't publish a lot of my own writing. I really should get into this a bit more. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely helps to put stuff out there, express yourself in whatever shape or form possible and, um, you know, get started hitting the keys so, um, or cutting videos or whatever it might be. Just get out there and express these things. I think this really helps to, to get into that groove of producing content, expressing your emotions or just um, having some time to yourself early in the morning or late at night to uh, sit down and write. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think uh, especially writing a video is like there, there's something to writing that is special. When you sit down, you're going over the sentence. You're like, how can I form this better? How can I structure that argument better? Uh, with video, it's really cool. It involves your speaking skills a lot, and it also mm -hmm. involves how you think, of course. Uh, but I think you uh, need also the writing thing, and, and the writing thing is something that um, is is missing on my side. I've thought a lot about it. I might start a newsletter with uh, the seven biggest lessons from my seven podcasts I did per week, uh, with oh, just nice. like list it up. Uh, this is something that I might start if I have a little bit more time because I cannot uh, handle the workload right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but uh, this is something I thought and I might uh, actually started it in April or May. So maybe even it's maybe I even started it uh, when, when this comes out. Let's see. Um, we are having an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who is the next guest. Uh, and uh, the question for you is, and it ties back to what we talked about a little bit, what changes would you mandate to the Bitcoin network, assuming you have total control? Oh, wow. Uh, so basically become God for a day <laughs> over the entire Bitcoin network. That is a very, wow, that's a very good question. I would, so network includes everything that includes main layer. And obviously the main layer has, um, uh, has a connection to all of these um, layers at the top. I would say finding a way to solve the liquidity issue in Lightning, simplifying it. I don't know, I shit and hated on Lightning before, but just with the thought, if if I could do it overnight like this, um, meaning it would be so simple that everyone can just get on Bitcoin in a self-sovereign way, let's call it, depends if they get on the main layer or into a scaling solution, this would be pretty cool. Whatever that would be, if it's inbound, outbound liquidity issues, you, you can solve instantly or... Um, all of these different implementations working in sync and like not breaking and all of that stuff, whatever it is, just trying to fix that most current need in these scaling and in between solutions. I think this would be the biggest benefit to Bitcoin. Um, otherwise, I couldn't think of, 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 of anything else at this point. Really, really cool. Um, Joel, I love to have you on. It was such an amazing discussion. I think, uh, like over one hour now, we talked about Bitcoin life and so many different things. And, uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, all the listeners for listening and watching in. Um, for people that now have questions about you or have questions about, uh, content, uh, want to ask you different things, maybe, and uh, want to reach out with you, uh, to you, um, where can people get in touch with you the best way? What's the single, a point where they can reach you okay uh, trigger warning for all of the um uh, oh he's got the blue check mark in his profile and stuff people uh, i'm also on the uh, i'm also uh, so i'm on linkedin I i'll send you the links to link below i'm on you know noster i am uh, if you're a threat if you're part of like the cool hipster gang but the easiest place to reach out to me is on twitter or x or whatever the fuck it's called um and it's underscore jkl and z or c 
depending where in the world you're coming from. Uh, my DMs are open. Uh, you can criticize me. Um, you, we could get into a Twitter fight, but still meet in person, you know, to have a beer. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best place to reach out. And uh, if you're any, on any of the art platforms, also reach out. I love to connect everywhere. The more Bitcoin that we need, uh, the better. Thank you, for, Trell, for being on. Thank you for taking the time. It was a pleasure. Thank you.